Good morning. I'm going to speak to you about a topic which has a universal concern, and that is titled as Reimagining Safety in a World with Nuclear Weapons. Spinning relentlessly in the boundless space of our imagination is our fears and our hopes. And both driven by human nature and in contemporary times accompanied by the power and progress of science and technology. But human agency has created, due to technology, the immense power of destruction, a power which today we say in terms of nuclear war. But the universe and the Earth today is threatened by a twin, which is called climate change. And climate change is something which all of you must have heard, and so are nuclear weapons. But the climate change that you heard about and you experience even today is about the global warming. It's about the melting of glaciers, the rise in sea levels, destruction caused by adverse weather, and so on. Of course, there is global recognition for this phenomena. And there is definitely a public consciousness that we need to do something about it because it is going to impact, it's already impacting us and obviously the future generations to come. So there is an international movement towards slowing down global warming and at the moment, we have a Paris Agreement of 2015, which, of course, the USA has threatened to withdraw. But this is about global warming. This is what we know. What we don't know is the potential prospect of climate change induced by nuclear explosions. But the impact of that, unlike global warming, is about global cooling. There are enough studies to show that nuclear explosions can cause global cooling, which will destroy the infrastructure of agriculture, transportation, and social order, or social stability. And in fact, will pose an existential threat to humanity itself. Studies, in fact, indicate that even if 100 weapons explode in a nuclear exchange between two nations, and those, what I'm talking about, are the smaller types, the ones which were used in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Even if that many weapons explode, the possibility of a threat to humanity exists. Of course, these studies which started in 1980s and was called the nuclear winter at that time, done not only by individual nations, 
except the USA, which has done an official study. The other were, others have been by private bodies. And it forced, or it prompted, the President of the United States, Ronald Reagan, and President Gorbachev of Russia, to declare that nuclear war must not be fought and cannot be won. Because the effect is what you see there on that slide. The effect is caused by fires of nuclear, which nuclear explosions will catch and the dust, the smoke and the soot which will go up in the atmosphere. That will block out the sun and therefore global cooling is what is taken. Enough computer models indicate that this is a possibility. So we now have a situation where the threat of nuclear exchange is not merely about what the explosions do, but about the potential prospect of even a regional nuclear exchange causing a threat to humanity itself. So, during the Cold War, the idea of nuclear weapons utility was based on the fact that it was meant for self-defense. Simply understood, if you use nuclear weapons against me, I will actually return in kind. That is what was called deterrence. You hit me, I'll hit you back. But the utility was not only for this, because nuclear weapons are one characteristic. The immense power of destruction, even of a single nuclear weapon. And also the speed of that destruction. So, because of this, the nuclear threat, when it is hurled against a nation, was always impacted directly the decision maker's mind because of the nature of the threat. And therefore, it was supposed to be used strategically. You could hurl a threat and try to change the behavior of the others. So the strategist thought that if you want to use nuclear weapons, it can not only be used for self-defense, it can also be used to coerce, to get somebody to do things against their will. But in the Cold War, and afterwards, we know that self-defense has succeeded. Nobody has used a nuclear weapon after Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But coercion was always failed. And the latest example is of the ongoing tensions between North Korea and US. The strongest nuclear power of the world is unable to coerce the smallest, which just nascent nuclear capability. So coercion really hasn't worked. Therefore, what has happened is, and what we need to be concerned about, is the fact that during the Cold War and after that, the world still has not seen a nuclear weapon used in anger. But let me tell you that there is sufficient evidence which is all recorded that we have had more than one or several providential escapes from nuclear weapons being used. Not because people wanted to use it, because of technical glitches, what do you call accidents of early warning. These are all well recorded. But what must be noted is that although we escape by a whisker in many cases, Nuclear weapons, in most of the nuclear weapon states, continue to be on high alert, which means they're all deployed 
to be used in the shortest possible time. The question for us to ask is, why are these weapons on such high alert? The answer lies in a military problem where military who have to operationalize all this caters for something which is the worst case scenarios. And one of the worst case scenarios is that they can be a bolt from the blue. That is, a nuclear armed nation can actually fire its nuclear weapons at us and that will be the end of us. So, to prevent that, the logic is the weapons must be on high alert. But this logic is a military logic. And it is only in nations where the political imagination has been captured by military logic that such a practice prevails. For nuclear deterrence, which has maintained the peace at least till now, is based on what we call a second strike capability. A second strike capability means that I have the capability of being struck and yet I will be able to survive and strike back. And because the other side knows that I can do this to you, they will not attempt to strike first. So that's the logic of nuclear deterrence. But this logic was used and has been given to the military to operationalize. And the military has found that operationalizing this logic of, of ensuring survivability of your nuclear arsenal and your command and control system is not an easy task. So what happened in the Cold War was that both Russia and the US ensured survivability through numbers. And therefore, they drove up the arsenals to about 70,000 weapons. But now we know that those numbers don't matter because even if you manage to strike successfully and knock out the other nation's nuclear wherewithal and command and control system, you as an attacker will still face an existential threat because of climate change. So what it tantamounts to of striking first is actually committing suicide for the fear of death. And what has happened now is while technology drives the military to try and, and improve survivability, it's a cat and mouse game. And normally, technology is actually catching and chasing its own tail. But the first use idea has endured amongst most nuclear weapons states. Because the idea that you must hit the enemy first is a military idea. It has a tactical gain but in the world of nuclear weapons, even if you do it successfully, you yourself will be affected because of the effect of climate change. But this fact has not received enough recognition by the nuclear powers themselves. Where it has received recognition is actually in the other parts of the of or other nations who do not have nuclear weapons. They have, in fact, 122 nations in 2017 has called in the United Nations for a ban on nuclear weapons or a nuclear weapons ban treaty. If, except for the nuclear powers, 
None, all of them have supported it. But the nuclear powers have it. Because it is unlikely, given the geopolitical flux in the world today, given the rising tensions between, the, between several powers, including the major powers, it is unlikely that they will, despite their promises earlier, give up nuclear weapons. The question is, what do we do if this is the state of affairs? If the trajectory of geopolitical tensions is about the prospect of war, how do we make the world safer when all these powers were actually getting into conflict with each other are also nuclear powers? It's possible just by reimagining one main role of nuclear weapons themselves. If the nuclear weapons powers restrict the role of nuclear weapons to purely self-defense, because they have it, because somebody else can actually use their nuclear weapons on us, and therefore I use it as self-defense. If, if they restrict the role to this core deterrence role, and not indulge in nuclear threats to coerce smaller or bigger powers or lesser powers, then there is a possibility that they could shift their nuclear doctrine from the idea of first use to what India and China are the two powers which have it, it's called no first use. India and China are the two nations which have declared in their nuclear doctrine that they will never, under any circumstances, be the first to use nuclear weapons. If the rest of the nuclear powers can adopt this, then there is a possibility that we will be safer. It's not that the, that the threat of nuclear weapons will go away because nuclear weapons are going to be there, the powers are not going to give it up, but at least we will be safe. So what should be done is the adoption of what we called the Global No First Use Treaty. All nuclear powers should sign a treaty which is no first use. What are the advantages? The first advantage is that you can't actually throw a nuclear threat against anybody because the only threat you can throw is the threat that I will retaliate if you use nuclear weapons against me. So there will be a reduction in the number of threats. Secondly, unlike weapons today, even during normal peacetime, they are at alert levels. We could have weapons which are not alerted. Because the use of nuclear weapons need not be deliberate. It can be accidental in times of tension. It can be by a misjudgment, miscommunication, misperception. Because you feel somebody else is going to use it against you, you might want to go first. You lower that possibility. And of course, you can arrest the arms race. At the moment, there is an unimpeded arms race between the powers that matter in the world. They are all equipping themselves to defend themselves against what they see is a geopolitical flux and rise of tensions. Uh, <coughs> and of course, while I, it's possible or it is not possible to solve political problems through a global North First Use Treaty, at least it will create the space for dialogue and discussion and therefore ensure safety. So, first thing which it requires is actually a public outcry or a public 
awareness of the dangers of the nuclear cloud which exists but not there in your daily existence. Because when it happens, we we'll hope it doesn't happen, it will happen at such a speed that you will not even know it. The idea is not to get to that point. So since at least the non-nuclear powers are very much for it, in fact, they want a complete abolition of weapons, which is not possible. The, at least the practicable thing to do is no global no first use. But this requires that nations will have to shed or jettison their shibboleths about the achievements of a first strike. Instead, they must at least understand that there is no need to threaten humanity in order to save it. Thank you very much. <laughs>